with you who's an amazing fact finder from this joint. Um, <laughs> Daniel was talking <laughs> about epidemiology or the science of sneezes, wheezes, and diseases. Um, I'm of the Soothean school of literature. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Uh, so, first off, what is epidemiology? So, epidemiology is basically the who, what, when, where, why, and how of disease. So, you're looking for spread of disease, you're looking for who it affects, you're looking for how it does that, and things like that. It really aims to describe the characteristics of the disease so that it can be controlled or tested. A lot of people think that epidemiologists are the ones who actually do the treating of the disease, the disease. But really, epidemiologists are trying to figure out knowledge of the disease, which is used by other people. Uh, and it includes a whole range of um, disciplines and medical professionals, well, not even medical professionals, just people in general. You've got everything from doctors and nurses, other medical professionals, researchers, which can include biochemists, virologists, geneticists, a whole bunch of other fields, um, social scientists, so people who actually study uh, the factors that increase the likelihood of um, getting a disease, like with HIV, we know that uh, women and younger children are more likely to be affected, and because we know this, we can investigate why. Uh, we've got statisticians. Uh, this is like my pet subject, but statistics is incredibly important for all science, and particularly epidemiology, because we're dealing with large numbers of people and trying to find patterns, which is really hard to do by hand. So statisticians are like our god, as much as statistics can be done all the time. Um, even things like urban planners, policy makers, local governments, outbreak control, emergency services. Basically, if you can think of something that you come into contact with, it will have a role in epidemiology in one way or another. Next. So what do epidemiologists really look for? So first up, they look for the cause of disease. Uh, so we've got a pathogenic disease that is spread by a particular organism. Uh, is it a lifestyle thing? Is it linked to the way people behave? Is it linked to um, a particular genetic, um, genetic line? Um, how it is spread? So we've got, is it airborne? Is it waterborne? Uh, does it come through food? Um, is, is it just a result of genetics? Um, as have you been smoking too many people? Um, and then we also look for where it's found. So the actual physical distribution of disease, so you look on a map and circle the area where it is, but also it's found in particular climates, to particular countries, uh, just very specific areas, because you'll find that some diseases you can only get in say tropical areas, or if you're hanging around by a marsh and there's mosquitoes there. And another thing that's probably the thing that epidemiologists are most known for are things like the mortality rate of disease. So epidemiologists are the ones who go and find those statistics of how quickly and how many people the disease is killed. But they also look at things like years of healthy, healthy life loss. So how many years will you have where you really can't do anything because of this debilitating disease? Or the damage that is left on a person after they've cleared an infection, um, but it just hangs around their system and maintains the disability for the rest of their life. Okay, next. <laughs> So, what we really want to do with this information is use it for science. And for epidemiologists, once we've got this information, we'll pass it on to people, or even do it ourselves, to really assess how much of a threat disease, a disease is. So, things like the common cold, most people can survive those pretty easily. However, something like malaria is a bit more of a threat because more people are killed and more people are disabled by that. So, we're of course going to preferentially treat malaria over the common cold. It's just sim simple risk versus reward. You're going to put in more money where there is a higher risk and more chance of reward. Um, another one is to control the source of the disease. So if we know where a disease comes from, we can put in control measures. Things like if it's spread through a mosquito, like malaria, for example, or um, just by contact with animals, like uh, a lot of viruses these days uh, come from bats. So if you can control that vector, which is what we call uh, the host of an A disease, then you can usually control the actual spread of the disease without having to treat it, without having to come up with an expensive vaccine. Which is why you see fairly commonly, again coming back to malaria, people using things like insecticides and mosquito in it to prevent them just getting bitten by mosquitoes so they don't have to go through the treatment. Um, they also use it to find treatments themselves. If you know the nature of the disease, you know 
know what causes it, you can find a way to treat it um, because mechanisms are very important in treatment. For example, if a disease is caused by a genetic defect and you can figure out that genetic defect, you can find a way to target that. So for example, there's a disease called phenylketonuria, which is where you have a uh, faulty um, yeah, metabolic pathway. So you can't process a particular um, amino acid called phenylalanine. If it's not treated, it builds up in your system and causes you to die, uh, and pretty horribly too. But a way of treating this is to actually administer the um, enzyme that will digest phenylalanine. And this is still very experimental, but that's the most promising thing, is actually give people that enzyme that's faulty in their genes so that it will um, alleviate that condition. And the last thing that we use it for, which we actually use a lot, especially these days with uh, things like cancer, um, a lot of lifestyle diseases, obesity-related diseases, and especially when we're looking at um, developing nations and the impact of disease there, we look at the social and economic impact of disease based on those, um, that information that we find. So, of course, we're coming back to looking at what kind of disabilities you get. Um, which demographics does the disease affect? If it affects you, the young people, then there's no one to take care of the older people. Or, uh, oh, for example, um, if, you have, if people in the prime of life, uh, so 20s to the 50s, are uh, dying, then you've got no workforce and the economy of a, of a country will crash. So that's really important too. So right now I'm getting on to the more interesting bit. So fundamentally there are two different kinds of disease we work with. There are some that blur the borders, but this is what we'll be talking about. So the two different kinds of disease we have are communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, I've just got some pictures to give you an idea of the examples I'm talking about. So this is a uh, cholera victim. Uh, cholera is a dysenteric or diarrheal disease um, caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae. It's waterborne. Um, and it used to be very, very common all over the world and now it's restricted to developing or even middle income nations. And then we have non communicable diseases, things like cancer, which can kind of just spontaneously arise in, in anyone, but they won't pass from person to person, at least not usually. Next. So, communicable diseases. Communicable diseases are the ones that most of us know about, things that are spread by pathogens. Uh, which is what we call the organisms that cause the disease. So viruses, bacteria, and parasites. Um, the problem with pathogens is that they can adapt to our treatment and they can become resistant to what we've got. So basically, if you um, try to treat pathogens just because of evolution, because of the fact that it is an organism, it will adapt to that and may be able to come back. Um, it also means you get many, many different strains of uh, pathogens. So once you figure out a way to, to cure one form of disease, another one will just spring up. And communicable diseases are characterized by the fact that they spread between humans. Um, you do get a little bit of crossover with zoonoses, which can pass from humans to animals and back again. But you, so the ones we're referring to are the ones that spread between humans. And they can spread in a number of ways, just depending on how you transport the pathogen, whether that's by coughing on someone, uh, getting germs is a broad term onto uh, what we call fomites, which are objects you come into contact with, you know, someone else comes into contact with, and things like that. As I was saying about zoonoses, they can be passed from animal to humans and back again. A really good example of this is the H5N1 bird, bird flu. Uh, I saw a picture of the virus that causes it down there. Um, and that literally passed from birds to humans through mutation and started causing, causing some serious illness. Fortunately, it never took hold, um, but there have been diseases that have. Things like um, SARS that came through bats um, and planted it in China and went on to actually become incredibly infectious in humans because humans had no resistance to it. And we have similar diseases cropping up today. And broadly, some of the ones that it includes would be malaria, AIDS, influenza, cholera, the common cold, the flu, um, things like staph that you may have heard of. Um, so the majority of things that you think of as diseases will be in communicable cat uh, category. So next up. So this is a big example of epidemiology in a contagious disease. So 
So Jon Snow was basically the father of modern epidemiology. Um, he didn't know much of what we know now. Back in his day, the prevailing theory was the miasma theory, which was basically that disease was spread by bad air. And he kind of differed in opinion from that. It was more of a variant of the miasma theory that he had, which was that disease could be spread, spread through contaminated water and contaminated food. So in 1854, he'd been working at, as a doctor for quite a long time, and an outbreak of cholera occurred in London. And he decided that once and for all, he wanted to show the connection between water and cholera. So what he did was bring up, was create this map. Now, on this map, it's actually one of the best diagrams of all time, if anyone who saw um, Chauvin's talk last week will tell you. Um, <laughs> it's basically each um, each house he went through and he figured out how many cases of cholera were in that house, whether so fatal or not. And he drew a line parallel to the front door of that house. And he noticed that there was this big cluster around the Broad Street waterfront right here. So he did some further investigation and found that this was kind of statistically significant. And he managed to convince the local council, which was then run by the church, which really was very skeptical about his, his, um, his waterborne theory, he managed to convince them just to try removing the pump handle. And the cases stopped. Well, not stopped completely because cholera is one of those things that spread. And, sorry, I'll just consult my notes for a second. What he found was, um, well, actually not him, a lot of reverends who had set out to disprove him, uh, found that uh, a local lady had been washing um, the nappies of a um, sick baby in the street. And what had happened was is that um, the excrement had gotten washed into an old septic, and that septic had started to leak into the well of the pump, and that just that little bit of contamination can cause cholera to spread. So he managed to show, without knowing anything concrete about the um, mode of transmission, which is bacteria. Um, that, you know, this was a result of excrement getting into the water. This was really significant because it motivated the councils of London to really clean up their act. And actually, um, the water company ended up getting into a lot of trouble because the water company that ran that pump all over had been taking water from contaminated parts of the Thames where sewage had leaked out. And that meant that lots and lots of people were getting sick. And that was the reason that the epidemic widely in London. So it's pretty impressive that just by using common sense and talking to people, um, John Snow managed to figure out what was going on with cholera. And to be honest, that shows you the power of epidemiology without microbiology. Um, it's really important. And one of the best things about this is that it's one of the first cases that used statistics to show the significance of things. Next up. So then we've got our non-communicable diseases. These things like your cancer, dementia, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, genetic disorders, lifestyle disorders, things like that. So genetic disorders are usually found in family groups, sometimes even ethnic groups. So for example, hemophilia runs in many European royal families and claims a lot of them because they're all interrelated. Um, and they've managed, to, they've managed to track that down, actually um, arising sometime around the time of Queen Victoria. So she may have had a spontaneous mutation leading to that, and now hemophilia runs in the royal families of Europe. Um, another example relating to an ethnic group would be sickle cell anemia, which is commonly found in many African nations, which is where blood cells are shaped oddly due to a mutation in a protein. It actually confers some immunity to malaria, which is why it's still around and hasn't killed off everyone. But if you get two um, alleles of what we call the two forms of that gene, you end up with all your red blood cells being malformed and you just can't um, process oxygen, you um, just basically die of tiredness and severe anemia. Um, another thing is with lifestyle factors, it's usually prevalent in certain cultures. So Western nations have a higher rate of obesity related illness uh, for obvious reasons. We like our food and we have too much of it. Um, we also lead sedentary lifestyles. But it's not just that. In some cultures, um, malnourishment is prevalent, usually due to socioeconomic 
economic factors. Um, a lot of the, develop the developing world really struggles uh, to provide food for enough people, and if they have enough food, it may not be nutritious. So you have things like vitamin deficiency, pure starvation, um, malnourishment, and you get a lot of really, really sick people simply because they don't have enough food. And a lot of that tends to be um, a lifestyle factor leading to disease. Here's just a couple of examples. So up the top here we've got Alzheimer's disease, which a lot of people will have heard of. It's a degenerative um, brain disorder, a form of dementia, which can occur randomly or as a result of predisposition by your genetics. And it basically causes your brain to degenerate. You can't remember things. Uh, there's a whole range of psychological issues, personality change, and it varies wildly from person to person. Um, and there's a whole range of diseases classified under dementia that cause this. But Alzheimer's is one of the ones that's been pretty extensively researched, which is why we've got these pictures of a brain showing the function um, in Alzheimer's is severely different. Another one uh, is atherosclerosis. Which um, is actually just a swelling and hardening of your arteries, which happens when you've got a high uh, cholesterol and fat diet. Um, you get deposition of fat and cholesterol in your arteries, and it starts to calcify, which means calcium gathers on it and it hardens. It causes massive swelling of your arteries, and basically means you can't pump blood anymore, often leads to heart attack, and is a, an increasing cause of death in Western nations. So another really cool case um, for epidemiology is smoking and lung cancer. So we all know that it took a while for people to figure out that smoking and lung cancer were linked. However, the link was recognized as early as 1929 because ever since smoking became a thing, people started to figure out that there might be a link here because lung cancer broke. It was virtually unheard of before then, but doctors start to see it more and more, and this is over nearly century before someone went, hey, maybe this could be linked. Uh, however, this could not be proven. There was not enough statistical data. There weren't enough people that were just being checked for lung cancer. A lot of people just died and nobody really gave a crap. But in 1956, a British doctor's study was published and provided really solid epidemiological evidence for this link. And what they what they did, these two people called, I believe, doo -doo 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 -doo, Dole, Richard Dole and Austin Bradford Hill, they put out a survey in 1951 to over 40,000 British doctors. And they asked them about their smoking history, so whether they were currently smokers, whether they had previously been smokers, how long ago was their last cigarette, were they non smokers? And then what they did over the few years after that. They looked at how many of those doctors died and how many from lung cancer. What they managed to show, because they had such a massive sample size, they got really, really solid data. And they managed to show that there is a massive co correlation between the amount smoked and lung cancer, especially the longer you smoke. They also managed to sh show that mortality decreased and decreased the longer you went without smoking. So once you stopped smoking, it started to decrease and the rate decreased for long you went without smoking. And they managed to show that all of these findings were statistically significant, which there have been some issues um, with people reviewing their study, but it's always remained significant, and it was the first thing to show a conclusive link. And this is why statistics is important, because you can see cases here and there, oh, this person spoke that they have lung cancer, and the fact is that lung cancer, even in smokers, is such a small portion that no one will really notice that pattern until you do something like this. Next. So, now I'm going to talk about my favourite of the weird diseases. So, <laughs> I'll actually have to bring up my notes for this because I want to, I want to get my um, facts right on this one. So, Kuro is a disease that occurred in tribes of Papua New Guinea. Um, specifically, let me consult my notes. The Foray, Yate, and Rufanufa tribes of Papua New Guinea. Um, it was first documented by Australian doctors in the 1950s, so obvi obvi obvi. Um, they noticed that these people were suffering from this thing that looked called the laughing death, or cool. And basically, what happened was these people, just over a period of a couple of years, would develop the shakes and just be shaking constantly. They would develop to walking. Um, personality would change, they'd experience slurred speech, they'd lose their fine motor skills. Eventually,
eventually, uh, it got to things like they couldn't speak. Well, they'd be laughing on control of it, hence the name of the laughing death. And once that developed, they would quickly just descend into a state of searchful paralysis. They would be able to, unable to stand or sit without help. And because they couldn't move, um, many of them experienced bed sores and then necrosis or infection um, and die as a result of that infection. Now, um, many people would have obviously die before then because paralysis has a whole number of effects on your body, including incontinence, loss of fun, and the inability to swallow. So some of these people just died now. In fact, often people would die from either infection or malnourishment far before the disease was getting any of them. So, after this was noticed by some of the Australian administrators, some researchers were sent in. Uh, Michael Alters and Shirley Lindenbaum, which were two Australians, uh, they were sent in to live with the Foray tribe and try to figure out the food. And what they noticed was that these tribes were the ones that still practiced cannibalism, even though it was technically illegal, but it was part of their funeral rite. So when a family member or a member of the village died, they would be eaten, and it was part of bringing the life force back to the village. And so they noticed that it only occurred in the cannibalistic tribes. So they thought they were the ones there. But they went further, and they noticed that it occurred eight to nine times more frequently in children and women. And after watching this happen, they noticed um, that the women and children were more likely to consume the brain and the nervous tissue of their relatives because the men were playing the prime cuts of meat. So the women and children would eat everything else. So they concluded that was probably something to do with the nervous tissue. Uh, so what they did was Michael Alters, who was a biologist, he, uh, along with Daniel Gadgetek took brain matter from a 11-year-old victim of the called Kigea when she died. Um, and they, and Michael Alves has actually used Kigea personally and up to her, like, her condition. And it, not only is it a great example of epidemiology, but it is really just a touching example of people actually respecting these tribes. Um, and uh, they used brain matter from her and injected two chips um, one of them, Daisy, within two years developed Kuru, which was pretty significant considering um, it usually took a lot longer to develop. Um, but they managed to show that there was a link between the brain matter and the um, development of Kuru. However, they could not find a virus, they could not find a bacterium, they could not find any form of path known pathogen that caused the disease. And they knew that somehow it was affecting the brain, which really narrowed down their options because a lot of things can't cross the blood brain barrier. What happens? Do you just want to explain briefly what the blood brain barrier is? Well, I was about to. <laughs> um, but what happens, um, the blood brain, brain barrier is basically a series of membranes which allows the, um, well, allows or prevents the passage of pathogens, um, of certain proteins, certain chemicals into the brain, like alcohol. And in a core patient, they knew it was something that crossed the blood brain barrier, so it had to be smaller than most pathogens uh, because it caused this kind of sponge, spongy kind of brain. Because um, this is the brain tissue of a core patient. Basically, you can see this, all these massive holes in it. This nice pink bit, that should be all of it. So they developed these massive holes, and that's what caused this degeneration. So they figured out it had to be something across the blood brain, brain barrier. And eventually, after lots and lots of thought and lots and lots of experiments, which are really complicated to go into, they figured out that what the cause of core is, it's actually a protein that naturally occurs in our brain and it's part of the structure of our cell. And this, they dubbed the prion protein, and a misfold version of the prion protein is usually referred to as a prion. And basically, the misfold version of this protein actually goes around the brain and converts each one of these prion proteins, the healthy ones, into its own form. This unhealthy form is of no use to the brain cell. And so the cells collapse and they cause this. Basically develop massive holes in your brain because you've got no other structural proteins holding your brain together. And slowly but surely, the um, prions will convert all your 
the uh, prime protein into their own form, and you'll eventually die from neurodegeneration. So, how are we going to treat this? There's not really any known way of treating it. But, um, cannibalism was stopped in Papua New Guinea, and the last victim died in 2005. And because of this discovery, they, were ma they managed to track down the source of this disease, figure out a way to stop it without having any treatment. So again, that shows you the massive importance of epidemiology. This theory was also crucial in figuring out what was behind mad cow disease, or what most well, what researchers call the Hope Sod Yakov disease, which is the same kind of thing, but a slightly different mutation. And the variant of Hope Sod Yakov disease is actually what you and I would know as mad cow disease, which is passed on to cows that eat the um, meat of other cows through industrial processes and people being very unethical and deciding let's just chuck cow meat in um, and then it passes on to humans and causes very similar symptoms to cool uh, There's of course a big fear in Britain, not too well, a few decades ago now um, of this disease and it's suspected that there may be a case, there may be cases of it coming up soon because the US has done very little to prevent uh, feeding of cattle with um, and basically, because if this is a protein, there's very little way of treating it, especially because it's a natural one. Uh, so the only way we can do this is by prevention and by containment. So basically, we need to stop feeding people, um, cattle and other cattle. We need to watch out for ingesting uh, neural material that hasn't been cooked properly. So don't eat squirrel brains unless they've been cooked properly. <laughs> there have been cases of these kinds of things happening. Um, and basically it's just, it requires a whole lot of industrial standards to prevent because there is very little we can do about this disease and that's why epidemiology is so important because we would never track down the cause of the disease and we would never have been able to control it if it weren't for something epidemiologists really trying their best. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I've got to say. Go next. Here is some fun little bits and pieces for you guys. So, if you are born and procrastinating, the WHO website, one of my favorite things for procrastinating, so no, it sounds nerdy, but seriously. Um, here's some, there's a list of some books that I really recommend to you guys. Richard Preston is one of my favorite writers because he actually includes a reference list at the end of all his books. Um, and The Hot Zone is one of my favorites. It tells you about the history of Ebola. Uh, the Demon in the Freezer tells you about smallpox. And Panic in Little Four is a compilation of articles. Uh, the Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in the World Out of Balance by Laurie Garrett is fairly out of date. It was written in 95, yeah, the year I was born. Um, <laughs> I feel really, really young now. Um, but it's a little out of date, but she talks a lot about how our lifestyle factors are influencing um, diseases that are coming in. Things like, um, oh, basically any, anything that lives in animals is becoming more and more of an issue due to our expansion of farming. So stay away from that. Um, the Ghost Map by Stephen Johnson tells the story of Jon Snow um, rather nicely for those people who aren't too well versed in the science of it. And I know that a lot of scientists will crucify me for this. Contagion, the film from 2011, is actually a really good example of how politics plays into this whole deal. Um, and it's really interesting. And if you're interested in courses, just consider taking ecology, health, and disease if you're a second year biology student or human biology, which covers a whole bunch of different things, and that one's in the lecture for Okay, questions? Yes? How do humans get, like, diseases from bats? Does it make people like eat bats or whatever? Um, dropping. Basically, what happens is bats will poop anywhere, and they, will, they are basically the dive bombers of the animal kingdom. What's more common, actually, is for bat guano, is what it's called, because people don't like <laughs> um, bat guano gets into feed of like pigs and things, um, or horses in the case of like tender virus up north, um, and it's eaten by those animals. It adapts so it can harm those animals and then it gets passed on to humans through them because we have more contact with those animals. And by sheer, it's a sheer numbers game that whether the amount of that virus is going to mutate and be able to affect you. That's why bird flu, like everyone's like, oh, it's going to come, it's going to come, and eventually it happens, but only in a few cases because it was just a numbers game of those unlucky people who came into contact with rat birds. Yeah. So 
Facebook photographs have to have touch the animal. <laughs>
And 
Huntington didn't really pop up until recently because until recently the um your life expectancy wasn't that high. Well, yeah. Yeah. Also, that and it has such similar symptoms to a lot of other neurodegenerative disorders, so we didn't know it was Huntington. People were like, oh, that's that's like Mary's Alzheimer's, or oh, that person's just an alcoholic. Yeah. 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 It has yeah. been yeah. Yeah. alcoholism because.